I'm Park Nicholson, Senior Research Associate at AICGS, and with me today is Robert Lehrman, an uh, Institute Fellow at the Urban Institute and a Professor of Economics at American University. Uh, Bob recently co-authored a report with Volker Ryan of the Federal Institute of Education, uh, Vocational Education in Germany for AICGS on building a robust U.S.-based, uh, work-based education and apprenticeship system at scale. And then can lessons from Europe help this process? Sure. So thank you for being with us, Bob. And uh, I wanted to go in and first ask you about this topic and why this topic matters. You heard in 2013, President Obama and his State of the Union address singled out Germany, Correct. not for its exports, not for its great scientific system, but for education, training workforce issues. So why is it relevant for the United States to look at this? Well, it's relevant because we have a relatively weak system of vocational education, um, and particularly weak in, is the combination that Germany has been able to achieve of a dual element, that is, learning at the workplace linked to some academic courses but with a much heavier emphasis on work-based learning. Um, so where we do have vocational education either in high school or in post-high school through community colleges and career colleges, very little of it has this integrated work-based and school-based system. Uh, and we believe that the uh, problem with that is that there's very weak matching, so people go to school but the match with employers is weak. Uh, the learning, we think, should uh, embody a lot of work-based learning because there are only certain things, there are only, there are certain things that you can only learn in the workplace itself. So for all these reasons, uh, we think it's very important. Now, you mentioned employers, and one of the main themes that we've heard in recent years is the skills gap concept, which to some has been trumpeted as a, a social issue that needs to be addressed, and some have criticized it as well, including uh, Paul Krugman last year who kind of called it a zombie idea, one of these grand ideas mm -hmm. that everybody's jumping onto. Right. So what's your take on that uh, critical issue? Well, uh, I think that the gap is in terms not only of finding people who are well qualified to fill certain positions, but also to enhance those positions at the workplace. In other words, to make them really good jobs. So employers can always dumb down their jobs and then find somebody to do them. The issue is how can we build uh, a system that encourages employers to use the maximum skill, the maximum productivity, and ideally along with that, the maximum wage for those positions. And that's where I think that um, we sometimes talk past each other. Mm -hmm. In the United States, you have uh, a tendency to believe more in the higher education route as the correct, correct career pathway. Right. And so how do you actually bring about change in the direction that you're talking about, and specifically with apprenticeship? Well, it's a long-term effort because we have to turn that idea around that what skill is is measured in educational attainment and test scores. But in, as, as is well understood by normal people and, of course, by the system, in Germany, Switzerland, Austria, some other countries, is that there's occupational skills. And those occupational skills are critical. Everybody knows that, but we build a system that doesn't acknowledge it. Uh, everybody knows that you need really strong employability skills, listening, teamwork, adapting to that occupational environment. But again, we don't build it into the system. So that's the first step. The second step is to uh, have a system that markets and funds and um, attracts, especially the employer side. Because once employers offer really good apprenticeships, people come. Mm -hmm. And so uh, 
Now, I think the fact that uh, there are some phrases that, you know, everybody wants their child to go to college and so on, I think that has a bigger effect on the way we fund uh, education and training than on actual choices that people would make. So especially, um, you know, if, again, if we have those really good apprenticeships, I think that's what will uh, draw people. Uh, just this week, uh, the uh, Economist magazine ran a story called The Weaker Sex, and they highlighted the decline of men in terms of educational attainment relative to women. But they mentioned and they singled out Germany uh, for providing these additional outlets that young males can identify with, can thrive in, as opposed to requiring them only to be in a classroom setting. Mm -hmm. So um, once we have these additional opportunities, I think more young people in America will thrive. You know, the Economist also talked about minorities in both countries in an earlier issue, and particularly in Germany, and that that has been a weakness of the system. How important is it for the United States to have these kind of programs that may be able to address uh, minority? Well, I think uh, we, we see uh, in the major cities, very high high school dropouts among minorities and even just inner city youth in general uh, dropping out from high school. Or maybe they eventually get some GED or some alternative credential, but they're not on-time graduates. On-time graduation uh, has dropped very low and especially, again, among the young males. Um, and so some of these systems are looking for new approaches. Um, of course, the main emphasis continues to be what I call the academic only approach. So let's get better teachers, let's use vouchers, let's use charter schools, uh, a whole variety of purely education-based Solutions And again, some of them may be good, but um, I think we need to broaden our perspective and uh, the groups that will benefit most are these minorities. Yeah. Now, in some cases, there have been minority leaders in the past that have viewed uh, apprenticeship type solutions as diverting their kids from college. Nothing could be further from the truth. If people learn and attain uh, and, and realize that they can know how to learn and complete a quality apprenticeship, that puts them on the road uh, for further education if they so choose. So um, it's engagement is the key point. Um, and uh, I think apprenticeships do that. Before we talk about the European systems a little bit, I wanted to get your sense of best cases and best practices in the United States. In your report, you mentioned a lot about Georgia and Wisconsin right. as initiatives that are uh, important to look at. And the possibility of expanding that nationwide may have some hurdles and it may be a difficult thing to achieve. So what is good about what those states do, and well, where do we go? Well, Wisconsin has a history of developing youth apprenticeship. Um, one of the tricky parts about apprenticeship language uh, in, say, Germany, Switzerland, uh, Austria, mm -hmm. and the U.S. is that our apprenticeship system doesn't attract people until their mid-20s. Um, and so what that uh, does is has a variety of problems. Number one, um, you don't have the built-in funding for the off-site courses that you would have at the youth level and that Wisconsin does have, although not there are some even issues with Wisconsin. But what Wisconsin has managed to do is developed really uh, clear skill standards 
for a range of occupational areas. Now, from my perspective, even Wisconsin doesn't utilize it as fully as they could. But they're, they are getting some additional funding. They are going to be trying to expand there. But they have a structure such that uh, employers can seamlessly enter, know what the standards are, hire an apprentice, and have that apprentice complete that standard. And they're good standards. In fact, um, I just ran into um, uh, a woman uh, that is trying to develop this. It's, I believe, the S uh, Union mm -hmm. program, uh, but not just for union members in Philadelphia in the healthcare area. And I suggested very much that they consult the Wisconsin healthcare standards because they have an array of of occupational areas that uh, the Philadelphia people could enter into. Um, it's really a matter of coordinating systems there. So in Wisconsin, um, one of the barriers has been that there's, for the off, uh, for the courses that are um, associated with the apprenticeship, there is not the type of funding that you would like to see. Um, and the problem is that any one high school might only have a few people in that occupation. So for them to have two or three courses on that is very costly per student. We have to get over that hurdle. We have to find a way of coordinating those courses. Uh, but otherwise, and then we have, a, we have to do a much better job of marketing to the individual employers. Mm -hmm. And you were mentioning the Central European systems, um, which have a much more top-down uh, approach and a, a historical legacy in making these interconnections. Correct. In the United States, you have a lot of these bottom-up issues coming together. Right. And then funding is an issue that you mentioned. So is there anything at the, the federal level that is being done or has been done in the past? You mentioned in your report in the 1990s there were efforts right. to push this through, but it failed. Correct. Can you describe what that failure was and where we might go in the future? Well, I think the failure took place early on because a lot of times policymakers, through certain anecdotes, uh, they, they are convinced by anecdotes. So there were some anecdotes about union opposition to youth apprenticeship. It's, it's never been clear to me that that opposition was that strong, um, that if the federal government had pushed through and said, we are going to test apprenticeship, that it would have been that difficult to get through. I don't think so. Um, but there was another orientation at that time that uh, school to work, school to career had to be for everybody. Otherwise it would be stigmatized. I think there's enough, there are enough people now who recognize that apprenticeships are quality and they can be quality and there's no need to apologize for them. And that if and that not everybody needs to go through the same route. And that apprenticeships can be for some subgroup of the population of youth without being downgraded. So there's a greater recognition of that. Um, the other thing was that, uh, so, so when the School to Work uh, Opportunities Grant legislation became, became law, there was almost no mention of youth apprenticeship, even though President Bush, the first President Bush, and President Clinton both liked youth apprenticeship. It got squeezed out. Uh, this time, I think people recognize that we're going we're gonna to go with apprenticeship. Now, it is still the case that, and, and so the federal government has sponsored some uh, funding for pilot projects, although again, even that funding, uh, you had to be 18 and above. So it, they, they still haven't gotten the message on 
uh, also building youth apprenticeship alongside the adult apprenticeship system. I think we're going to have to f not choose one or the other. I think we have to move forward with both. And it's clear from what you just said that it's a bipartisan issue, too. It's Correct. And even now we have uh, Senator uh, Scott from North, uh, South Carolina. We have uh, Governor... Um, uh, we have the governor of Wisconsin, Walker. Mm -hmm. Scott Walker, that is uh, very much behind apprenticeship. And we have the president that's behind it, and we have uh, Patty Murray, and we have uh, uh, Cory Booker from uh, New Jersey, all behind apprenticeship. So I think it has to be a bipartisan initiative. Mm -hmm. For it to succeed, it will have to be a bipartisan initiative. That's good. And I wanted to bring you back to the, the Germany example a little bit because uh, both you and I have looked at this uh, uh, for, for a long time and you much longer in terms of seeing the ups and downs of interest in Europe and interest in yes. Germany's skill system. And uh, just recently, the embassy has sponsored a skills initiative to reach out to states Correct. about what the German workforce model is like. And also there's an agreement uh, this month between the two countries to kind of develop a joint research agenda. So where do you see that impacting the relationship and that impacting the U.S.? Uh, well, I think it's very positive. Uh, and it's easy to be disappointed when uh, people from the embassy visit a governor who is very enthusiastic and then not much happens. But it has an impact. Uh, we have to look at this as a long-run strategy. It's not a quick fix. Uh, turning around a whole nation's way of getting people ready for the workforce, of entering careers, uh, getting companies to change their uh, recruitment and training practices to be able to say, hey, this can be of service to us. We can get a better quality employee it really won't cost us that much more because uh, we're taking people when they're young, when the wages are relatively low, and they learn and they are much more likely to stay with us. So we'll be able to recoup some of that investment. That learning process takes time. Uh, it takes time for any given em employer and it takes time to uh, disseminate across and have that diffusion process uh, really take hold. So uh, everything that the German Skills Initiative is doing is positive. It's going to be uh, influential. But we still have to have some leaps, some effort to step forward. So uh, the DOL grants of $100 million, there'll be these pilot projects. Um, that's going to keep it in the news. That's going to keep uh, uh, examples flowing. And if, as I think will happen, uh, these examples will be highly positive, uh, you'll get some good results. Um, one thing, um, can I say something? Yeah, about? go for it. Okay. <laughs> um, recently, I heard a spokesperson from the U.S. Chamber. Hmm. Uh, emphasize something that's related but doesn't really capture apprenticeship and that was what they call their supply talent supply chain uh, initiative. Um, I think that could be melded with the apprenticeship initiative but it has to have some additional components. It can't be just framed as something that's good for an employer's supply chain. It has to be something that shows uh, that the individuals are more than cogs in a supply chain, but rather uh, will have a kind of occupational pride and identity. Uh, this is something that, again, um, Americans aren't so used to. Uh, they're, they're used to it with regard to professional occupations. Somebody's a doctor. He says he's a doctor. He's an anesthesiologist. He's part of that community of practice of anesthesiologists. But they're not used to it 
at the middle and lower levels. Increasingly, we have certain areas like being a chef. So being a chef is now cool, and it's part of a community of practice. But if we think about how in Germany you're able to have more and more of these occupations as having that kind of occupational pride, identity, and community, we, we have a long way to go to get there. And one of the great things that I think that Germany does for it, as does Switzerland, uh, is provide an example where a modern economy that is doing well economically is able to use this method of learning and this um, ra raising of occupational quality um, across the board and not have to, even though, I mean, there's uh, German companies certainly invest abroad, they produce some of their parts abroad just as we do, but that that doesn't need to stand in the way of broad-based growth of growth that uh, widens the spectrum of occupations that have careers, that have pride, and that have identity. And they were able to do this. Um, right. Yeah, over many decades. So Able to do it over yeah. many decades yeah. and able to do it in today's times. Great. Well, with that, Bob, uh, thank you very much for being with us and to talk about this. Nice and, to be uh, with you. Thank you.